So in the past few weeks, we're dealing with issues of judgment, and then I brought it into the high priesthood and related judgment and high priesthood, and then you know the, the uh, necessities of judgment, the proper motivations for judgment, and the proper balances of judgment. You know, you have mercy, grace on the right, and you have judgment, or you have penalty and judgment and all that stuff on the left, and to have a perfect balance and a perfect vision for righteous judgment, there's certain conditions that have to be met. Once One is that you're not seeking your own will, right? My, Jesus said, my judgment is just because I don't seek my own will. And then we talked about Isaiah, woe is me, for I am undone, I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips, so you, you can... You can identify sin and you can identify with with the sin so that after you've come to that condition, then when you judge, knowing the depravity of others, but knowing also your own depravity, the motivation's not coming from a sense of highness, of haughtiness, because you know your own. Like you, you know you're a partaker of it as much as the people you're preaching to, and it, it's a, it eliminates, it's God leveling the, playing field so that it doesn't come forth as a putting forth of the finger. Mm-hmm. Alright, so and uh the you know I usually deal with words and fundamental things and foundational things. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So this week I was thinking about fear again. Fear. There's godly fear and there's ungodly fear. The uh Simplest way to uh, distinguish between fear and ungodly fear, I've always liked to say it this way and think of it this way, is that godly fear moves, moves you. Ungodly fear paralyzes you. You ever been afraid and you go into panic and you freeze? You don't know how to react, you don't know how to respond. That's ungodly fear. Ungodly fear puts you in a panic and it paralyzes you. Godly fear moves you. And Noah, being warned of God, moved with... Yeah, yeah. And and the fear is also the beginning of everything. And I I know we said this all before, but I'll rehearse it again. Nobody started making a move to God by the love of God. Although you have to follow on to know the Lord. You have to follow on to make sure that this is a relationship that has its foundation and motivation up from... From love, loving God and God loving you. Of course, God has to love us first, right? This is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave himself for us. So God first is the instigator of he sets his love upon us. And then eventually as we come to know him and realize what you know how bad we were or are and our sins are forgiven, then the same unto whomsoever much is forgiven, the same loveth much. And it becomes an, an issue of love. It, it matures into that, but the beginning of the the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as, Mark, as the Bible says in Mark, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is written, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's John the Baptist. He came on the scene, scene saying, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the beginning of it all. So the beginning of salvation is the promoting of godly fear. Just like as a foundation, you look at judgment as a foundation, with looking at judgment as a foundation, the church can have no savor without judgment. And judgment is bringing to light. You know, as the church manifests what is the true standard of holiness, what is the true image of God, as the church perfects its uh, exercise of judgment, then it, it, it delivers a savor to mankind. Remember we talked about the Christian is a savor of life and death. Christian is a savor of life to them that are being saved and they're a savor of death to them that perish. And that all comes as a result of, of judgment. Well, when Jonah... When Jonah came into Nineveh, what was he preaching? Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It was a message of judgment. It was a message of impending destruction and penalty. And that was the beginning of Nineveh's dealings with God. 
You know, and of course they they repented, right? They repented. Three days, three nights, the whole place put on sackcloth and ashes and the animals too and everything else. But so, yeah, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment and shall condemn this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Well, people do not like it. They characterize judgment as hate, hate speech. You know, if I stand up and say, uh, to be a whoremonger is immoral, or if I stand up and say, homosexuality is a deviant form of behavior and is not condoned by God, it's unnatural, it's ungodly, and it's unholy, and all these people that do such things shall, you know, shall be destroyed, they shall die, they shall go to everlasting. If I say that, and it's the truth, whether my motivation is to condemn you, or whether, whether my motivation is pure, and I come in the righteousness of God and say it. Well, someone's going to say I'm full of hate speech. And judgment is an indictment. Judgment is an indictment. It's not the final condemnation of somebody. You know, you declare that if such and such continues, then this is going to be the result if you continue. That's not condemnation. That is simply a revelation of true cause and effect of the spiritual laws that exist as a result of God's word. And of course, as a Christian, you make those indictments to those who are endangering themselves and also endangering others by the way they act and by the things they teach and by the things they say and how they're talking and, and so on. You know, we heard preachers say, well, if a man is uh, shamelessly and needlessly sort of exposing himself in a dangerous way and he's doing it in the middle of uh, the interstate highway and a big transport truck is about to run him over, well, don't, don't I have a right to yell and scream at him a little bit and say, hey, hey, you know, stop that. You're going to get hurt. You don't want to get run over by the transport truck. Well, well I, we, we talked about this before and the issues of judgment, how our, our whole society, uh, if you look at politics, you have left and right, you have the liberal Democrats on the left, and you have the conservative Republicans on the, on the right, and you have varying degrees of that stuff as, you, as, you, as, you, as the scale goes from one end to the other. But the extreme liberal-minded people are... Uh, their, their so-called uh, claim to having rights and liberties that no one else has a right to tell me what to do. I mean, clearly abortion is murder, right? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to go uh, picket abortion clinics or anything because th those are people that are without. They're not in the church. Them that are without, God judges. So I'm not going to try to personally involve myself to stop the tide of abortion that's there. The Bible sort of alludes to that. The Bible alludes to a lot of evil things that will happen towards the end of the age, and it's going to happen, and it has to happen, and the Scripture has to be fulfilled, and we're not going to stop it. Are we going to stop the New World Order? We're not going to stop it. Are we going to raise up action and protest and, and, and forbid them to bring forth the mark of the beast? It's impossible, because it's written, and the Scripture has to be fulfilled. So, But we indict it, don't we? Can you, just, can you not indict that? Abortion is murder or anything that you do to stop the natural motion of the bringing forth of life, no matter where it is in the process. You know, whether it's in the womb or out of the womb, <laughs> it's a motion of life that has begun and you interfere with the process and halt it. Anything that halts the process of life like that is akin to murder. Right? So... But, but women will swear, you know, you, have, you don't have a right to tell me what to do with, with my body. And we talked about the crazy mindsets that people have. Of, if, my, if my son wants to eat junk food in the cafeteria at the school and, and, and uh, you know, bring ill health upon himself, that's his right. Well, you know, that's, that is denying the sensibility of what's good in favor of what you think is right. It's all based on you, you can't tell me what to do. You have, no, you have no right to, what, as they say, judge me. It's an issue against righteous judgment. That's what it is. Yeah. Now, I might get into sphere. The way I'm talking, I'm going to skip over to something here. So, 
the beginning of any relationship with God or coming to perfection is godly fear. That's the beginning of it all. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge and fear of the Lord always go together. Um, in Isaiah it said the... Uh, it talks about the seven spirits of God, the spirit of counsel and might, the, the, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. So fear, you cannot fear God until you know something. Nineveh had no fear of God until they knew that there was a declaration that God's judgment was pronounced against them. Then that gave them, at that point, that knowledge put them at a crossroads. They can either choose to believe or they can say, oh, this is a bunch of crock and harden their hearts and go on in their, in their sin, right? Yeah. Because Fools, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So someone has to bring you the knowledge of God to, to start it off, off with. And whoever brings you the knowledge of God, if, if, if we're at a starting point, then that knowledge of God is going to support God's judgment God's uh, penalty on sin and the present condition of you or present condition of man in general. That, and that knowledge is going to illuminate the fear of God to you. It's going to present the fear of God to you. At which point, you make a choice. The fear of God is something that is received by the will of a man. Repentance is according to acknowledging the truth. That's where it starts. Now, that's not the finishing line. That's the starting blocks. You acknowledge the truth, and it'll, it'll, it'll lead you into a cleansing process and a relationship with God and all of that. It'll follow through to a lot of other things, but it starts with acknowledging of the truth. So right at that point, you, you have to choose. They hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. But what happens is when men, as the Bible says, this is the condemnation, not the actions and the deeds of the flesh that the flesh commits, because every sin, whether soever men may sin and blasphemy, shall be forgiven unto a man. Whether soever they blaspheme, however they sin and blasphemy, it can be forgiven, it all can be forgiven. But what's the condemnation? That light, lights come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. They, neither would they come to the light. Wouldn't choose the fear of God. And when you don't choose the fear of God, it's because your heart is preferring the darkness. It's preferring to protect its present evil status. Some people will actually, you know, the heart is deceitful and De desperately deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it so people will defend they will protect they'll protect their ignorance and willfully reject the fear of God and on what basis do people how are people persuaded to reject the fear of God oh they're just so full of hate they just want to criticize me they just want to Put me down and bring me down. They say that that is hate. They say it's hate. But as I said before, the church has a not only uh, an ability, but the church has a mandate and an obligation to perfect righteous judgment and to speak the word of God in such a way that promotes the fear of God because by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And I'll add evil practices, evil deeds. Evil lifestyles, evil conversation, by the fear of the Lord. But fear of the Lord must be chosen. You have to receive the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord will come when you believe and receive the word of judgment that comes out of the mouth of the church or man of God or preaching or whatever. That's how Jonah came. That's how John the Baptist came. So, leaving therefore the principles of the doctrine of Christ in Hebrews 6, let's go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, and resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So, eternal judgment are part of the first principle foundations of God. Eternal judgment's in there. And so, how it gets misconstrued, how it often gets misconstrued. 
Okay, so anybody with a, that comes with an indictment of evil, someone that was identifying that which is evil, if, you know, if they're set by God or if they have a, the righteous motivation, a, a warning and a warning of judgment and penalty of the continuation in that evil, and anyone who points out the possible damnation that could, could have come as a result of continuing in that, for the continuation of that sin and for the embrace of that sin, you know what I, you know what I mean by, by embrace? Someone who embraces has an affection for the sin, has an affection for the lust to the extent where they don't want to break off the lustful activity because they like it. They would not come to the light because they love the darkness more than the light. You know how we all used to hear how they, they believe the captain of the ship more than they believe Paul. No, they love the practice of their lust more than they want to choose the fear of God. So anyone coming forth with, with a, uh, a scriptural, scripturally sound indictment of such things is branded as somebody who's judgmental and full of hate. Full of hate. Now, to people who love darkness rather than light and who have chosen to embrace and prefer and pursue their lust, now remember what the Bible says before I go on any further. Remember what the Bible said about God's people in the wilderness. They were not estranged from their lust. Because they didn't choose the fear of God. Therefore they falsely pacified their own conscience and became dull and seared in their conscience so that the continuation of that sin had no convicting effect upon their conscience. And they continued in it. They weren't estranged from it. They still liked it. They still embraced it. Embraced it. Held on to it. Preferred it over Choosing the fear of God. Now I'm not talking about some unsaved person wrapped up in some sin or lust out there who's never known God. I'm talking about us who know the who know the judgment of God. That you do these things worthy of death. Not only do them, but have pleasure in others that do them. Yeah. And treat it all with lightness. The fear of God is directly related to the, the, the sobriety and the gravity and the intensity of God and impending judgment. Certain judgment. And what fights against godly fear? Lies and lightness and foolishness and mirth and you know, false prophets cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Fools make a mock of sin. They make light of it. Oh, it's not that bad. Yeah. Well, that's what the devil did in the garden in the first place. Oh, you shall not surely die. Make light of it. No, oh, sin, don't worry about that. No, sin is sin. Sin is exceeding sinful. All unrighteousness is sin. We can go on and on and on and on about sin and its consequence and the necessity of overcoming sin in this life. And we've talked so much about that, I'm not going to go into that. But I'm moving to a scripture now. Okay, so what if I say, uh, what if I say if, uh, a continuation of whoremonging is a... Uh, uh, Evil, and if you do such things, you will not inherit the eternal life, but you will go to the lake of fire. Or what if I say, you know, homosexuality is a deviant lifestyle. It never will be accepted by God. No such thing as a homosexual Christian. And if you do that, you will go to hell. You will go to the same fire and brimstone that Sodom and Gomorrah suffered. If you don't repent. I'm, I haven't condemned anybody by saying that. I haven't condemned anybody, right? Now, I could say it out of... Uh, uh, ill will too, or what have you. But the point is, 
is that you cannot undermine, just like I was saying before, you cannot undermine or treat light or shove off or eliminate or, or uh, neglect the exercise of judgment you know, for fear that, oh, I don't want to be judgmental, oh, I don't want to be hateful. Well, that's good. I'm glad you don't want to be uh, condemning and, and hateful. Neither do I. But nevertheless, we can't be persuaded to leave off the exercise of judgment because that's what people are saying about us. Because people will always say that about you, even when you come forth in righteous judgment. All right, so now here's the scripture I'm going for. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and you cannot serve the devil. So what do we mean by serve God? What do we mean by serve the devil? Chiefly, what we mean is you can't yield your members to the devil and let the devil perform evil deeds in your flesh and let it serve him by yielding your body to the motions of Satan and then also say that you're yielding and you're serving the Lord because you can't serve two masters. You know, even this, this principle is so um, pertinent. It's so applicable that God had a carnal singer, famous man, Bob Dylan, have a, a hit single on the worldly pop church called Serve Somebody. And that was the chorus. You're going to have to serve somebody. You're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil. And it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. So we can't say God hasn't trumpeted this principle to the entire generation, because He has. See, you're going to serve God, or you're going to serve the devil. When you're serving the devil, you're not serving God. So, and the, at, at stake here, or at, the, at issue, is who you yield your members, servants to obey and you yield it to the deeds of unrighteousness then then you are the servant of you are the servant of the devil okay no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other so you can't serve two masters so, in the first case, either will hate the one and love the other, that's referring to a righteous man. You can't serve two masters. And when you hear the indictment of God against you, know, against you and uh, your sinfulness and whatever your practices that are, not, that are not godly, and you choose the fear of the Lord, you say, Oh my goodness, what must I do to be saved, right? And you begin to hate those things that are interfering with your status with God. You hate it. You hear testimonies from various brothers and things. One of them was an alcoholic, and he was, then he became saved, and you know he was still drinking after he accepted Jesus Christ for a certain period of time. He was like the Romans 7 thing. He didn't want to do it, but he was compelled to do it. And he came to a point of agony, and he, he actually cursed the alcohol. So I curse you. I curse you, you foul bottle of alcohol. I hate you. You are destroying me and I hate you. But why? Because he was trying to love God. <laughs> or he was loving God. Let's not say trying. He had entered an exercise of embracing and loving God and pursuing God. So you can't serve two masters. And if because either one of these two things is going to happen. Either you hate the one, you hate the devil that's trying to make you do evil, and you love God. And if you don't, if you don't come into that status or category, then you hold to the one. You, you hold on to your evil, and you despise the one that's bringing indictment against you. See, that's second category. Hold to the one and despise the other. That's not the godly state. That couldn't be the godly state. The only godly state could be the first one. 
Because he hates the one and loves the other. Now how can love be <laughs> not of God? It means that you hate the evil that you're trapped in and because you're loving God. The second state is you hold to the one. You are not estranged from your lust. You still like it. You still prefer it. You're looking for an excuse. You're looking for a provision. You're looking for a conscience-searing counsel. You got your itching ears. Now, people always accuse me of, uh, challenge me about the legitimacy of my office as a teacher because they say, oh, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Well, that's not just limited to he uh, heaping individuals to yourself. You're looking for a, a spirit to teach you a false counsel, to sear your conscience. <clears throat> yeah, having that conscience seared with a hot iron, speaking lies in hypocrisy. You know, Timothy, right? For of this sort are they which creep, creep into houses, lead captive silly women laden with sins, led about with divers lusts. From such, turn away. Why did they leave Jesus? Why did they leave Paul? Well, they didn't leave Jesus because Jesus was deceitfully using his authority to pursue his lust for cars or lust for women. They didn't leave Jesus because of that. They left Jesus because of other reasons. But now if someone is abusing their authority and their power to hold on to their lust and despise everybody else who, who challenges that, as an ungodly and unholy practice that must be repented from. For not only for your sake, because you're putting yourself in danger, but also because of a position that you may be in, putting others in danger to receive the same false counsel and thereby begin the motion of a spreading plague. When, remember we were talking about judgment? When do you rise up in judgment? When do you stand up for God against the workers of iniquity and the evildoers. You know, the psalm says, Who will rise up for me, God says, and stand up against the workers of iniquity and the evildoers? When do I take, as a, take this sword and begin putting it forth as judgment against evil? When? When the plague spreads. When not only is an individual involved in a certain activity and a lust, but his embrace of it, his holding on to it, because he's not estranged from it. He's holding on to his lust. And he's despising the others who would challenge him. And therefore, others are emboldened to do the same thing he's doing. And it's becoming a spreading plague. Phinehas executed judgment and the plague was... Yeah, so as soon as the plague spreads... I'm, I'm, just, I'm just rehearsing the criteria of judgment that I gave weeks back. And applying it to this. So, you hold to the one and despise the other. You accuse those who bring the righteous revelation of the righteous judgment of God for your good, and you despise them. When you see people rise up against you, when I see this, when I see people rise against, uh, up against me and against others that I know, and their charges are little more than... Um, a bunch of insults, okay, or a bunch of threatening, of slaughter and uh, bad things that are going to come your way with scant or little or no scriptural basis whatsoever. That's coming from a heart of despite. That's coming from someone who doesn't really have a substance of, of, of the charge and who is holding on to the one, the lust. Holding on to the lust and despising the other. Alright, now uh, let me read a scripture in Leviticus 19, 15 through 19. You shall do un no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. So very we're seeing both sides of judgment here. Not only shall we 
be uh, do no unrighteousness, and not only shall we judge fairly, no no respect for the poor, and no favor to the mighty, right? That would give give you uh, the liberty to give the same clear judgment out, the indictment or the 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 revelation of the word of God, regardless of the person's status. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. Did we not go through great detail that the function and operation of the church is that when the anointing hits and the man of God is speaking, he's speaking as the oracle of God. I'm, I, I, I may not be the oracle of God when I go out there and do a job at a motel. I'm fixing the toilet. But if I'm in a, a Holy Ghost sanctified filled meeting and the anointing of a God is upon me, I'm speaking as the oracle of God. I'm the mouthpiece of God. Don't look at the individual so much, right? But look, look at what God is doing. He, it's a functioning part of the high priesthood and on his breastplate was a, on his breast was a breastplate of judgment. Anybody in that role, God can use to illuminate and bring forth judgment. And preaching under that kind of anointing the, as far as the preacher is concerned, as an oracle of God, he, he's not going to be concerned whether you're the lowest saint that ever existed in the last 6,000 years or whether you're the Apostle Paul himself. He doesn't care because he's the oracle of God. He's going to respond the way the Holy Ghost moves through him in the righteous judgment of God. Yeah. But the warning's there. Don't be unrighteous in judgment. Don't have a false balance. See this thing with a left eye and a right eye. We're not condemning. We're saying, wow, this is dangerous. This is peril. This is treachery. This is urgent. We have to pay attention to this issue. Something has to change. You're in danger. You're putting others in danger. And you're denying all of that. You don't think the judgment and the intensity of God's indictment against sin, it doesn't come with a sense of desperation in God's heart Himself? You're endangering yourself and meekness instruct those that oppose themselves. But I, I'm telling you, I could come with the greatest, greatest purity of godly nature and the, the divine nature of Jesus Christ that I could muster or ever come manifested through me. I could be as pure as his intent as I could possibly be in the sight of God, by the power of God. And I will still be accused of promoting hatred and condemnation. Now, not only do we, we don't want to run up and down as a talebearer, you know, Righteous judgment isn't going behind the scenes and whispering and speaking evil of your neighbor all the time. In, you know, in a mind that's puffed up like a Pharisee. Oh, I'm glad I'm not like him. You see what he did? Or all that stuff. Right? So we don't want to be like that in judgment. And yet, this Leviticus 19 section of Scripture has all of the elements here. We're not supposed to be afraid of the persons of the mighty. Well, he's a mighty man, so I better withhold my judgments because you know, he's a mighty man. I better not better leave him alone. So I better not utter these things that God showed me because he's a mighty man and I don't want to... Well, the Bible says, no, you don't be a respecter of persons when you're sitting as an oracle of God. Now, after that, don't, don't go up there as a talebearer and gossip about it. That's not right either. In righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Don't go up as a talebearer among thy people. Don't stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother. Now this is really interesting. Because, you know, I think of the times that I hear people being accused of hate, myself being accused of hate, for just simply preaching the word of God after I have given not days or weeks or months, but I've given years of diligence pondering, seeking God, clearing myself before God on these issues before I speak. I've said years before God, before bringing forth these kinds of indictments and being accused of, of hate. 
Boy, it's, you, you don't want to call good evil and evil good. You don't want to call the love of God bringing mourning. You don't want to call that, you know, carnal hatred. The Bible says, woe unto them that do that. Woe unto them that do that. But listen to this. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. I'll sit there and just suffer him to go on in his sin and go on in his sin. Now, I know there is a time to suffer sin to continue for a while so that the man has opportunity to come to himself, right? As we pointed out with the whole issues of judgment, is, uh, you know, a, 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 we'll look at Psalm 50 maybe before, again, before the night's over. The Bible talks in Psalm 50 how um, the, the wicked man was the... Uh, consenting with a thief and partaker with adulterers and slandering and all of this stuff. And the Bible says, and God says, I kept silence. I didn't do anything. I kept silence. There's a lot of the time that's what we do when we see evil. We, we keep silence. We sit back and we watch and we wait and we say, okay, what's going on? You know, to a certain extent, evil has to be manifested in the church. Iniquity has to be discovered. It has to be revealed. And we're going to see things. And so, let's not jump the gun and judge anything before the time. So we watch and wait. We do nothing. But what if, what if you've been seeing it for, like I say, what if you've been seeing it over and over and over again, continually for two years or five years or ten years or fifteen years or twenty years? And what if you've given your own personal diligence to clear yourself before God? Well, that's a different matter, right? That's a different matter. But anyway, but you see how the real hatred... It's just leaving your brother alone in his sin sometimes. Suffering the sin to be upon him. The real hatred is not rebuking your brother when he's in a perilous, treacherous exercise of sin. He's in a perilous, treacherous exercise of sin and you don't say anything? You mean he's on the interstate shamelessly exposing himself and uh, so caught up in it he doesn't see the transport truck ready to, ro to run, run him over and you turn aside and you don't say anything to him? There's the hatred there. So contrary to our accusers, it's not all hatred then, is it? It's not all hatred, this stuff coming out of our mouths or out of my mouth. Okay, so thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So there is something that can prove to be difficult at times, right? Knowing righteous judgment and talking about judgment and sin and all that sort of thing, and yet uh, we are advised, don't let that allow some kind of grudge to come in your heart against the uh, children of, of thy people. So you see this Leviticus portion of Scripture? It's just a five verses, but it's, it says so much about all, all the sides of judgment here. Both sides of it. Because we, we know this Scripture. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. Again, but those who love the darkness and hold on to their sinful activities will not call this righteous. They won't say it's the righteous smiting them. All right. So this is real. Uh, Psalm 19. We'll go back to a little bit of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is clean. And in that sense, it's clean. It's not, it's not, it does, it's not the promise of, uh, it's not the paralyzing kind of fear. It's clean. It has the indictment. It has the warning of the consequence of continuing in the sin. It also has the invitation of repentance which implies the hope of reconciliation and salvation. You know, uh, godly sorrow, working repentance not to, unto salvation, not to be repented of. 
So the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. Warned? Okay, don't call the warning of God the hatred of God. Remember we talked about Naomi. I went out full, came back empty. Why call me Naomi, seeing the Lord sent me out full, come back empty? Uh, seeing that the Lord God Almighty, and, and that the Lord God Almighty has testified against me. Yeah, we, we don't want an sim- a oversimplified idea that words of judgment against conduct that will fall out to destruction and damnation, that is, that is uh, an indictment against, but it's not against you. But people who are holding on to their lust will say that that, that is against them. Well, the indictment of God against our evil is not against us, ultimately. So, so we have people misidentifying the righteous judgment of God against what we're doing in order to turn us back again unto salvation. They're saying that that is somehow against God or against themselves. No, we have to realize that we're going to hear things, God making indictment against. So, um, moreover by them, the fear of the Lord, the... uh, Judgments of the Lord, they're again linking judgment and fear. They're true and righteous, more to be desired than gold, sweeter also than honey and honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. So, of course, there's things that we do, we don't even realize that we're doing them. And that's, uh, you know, that's why we need to have judgment and have things discovered and dealt with, have our sins going on before us, rather than following afterwards. Now, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. So this, these presumptuous sins are a pre pre uh, cursor or a um, something that goes on before that leads to the great transgression. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. So presumptuous sins, again, are sins that occur among those chiefly that are holding on to their lust. They are protecting the practice of their sin. They're protecting it. And they are despising anything or anybody or any source that challenges that. And they are misunderstanding that and, and misidentifying it as somehow being not godly and against them and so on and so forth. When yeah, It is against your evil practices. Yeah, it is. Just like God indicts me against my evil practices and you against your evil practices. That doesn't mean God is against me. That doesn't mean God is full of hate because he indicts against what you're doing, that you're opposing yourself and causing error. False prophets cause their, my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Don't make light of it. You can't, because you're undermining the fear of God, and that's the foundation of it all. It's the foundation of it all, the fear of God. So don't slander the, uh, the knowledge of God, bringing the fear of God, indicting against you as being against you. It's not against you. All right, so keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. That's when you second guess the mercy and the grace and forgiveness of God. You presume on the holy attributes of grace and favor from God and forgiveness of God. And those attributes of grace have been enabled and empowered and brought to you by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's how grace is brought to you. By the blood of Jesus Christ. And you second guess and presume on those things. Well, how would you do that? Oh, it doesn't matter if I commit this sin, because Jesus already paid the price, and after I commit it, I'll be forgiven. 
<laughs> that is second guessing the attributes of grace and mercy. That is presuming on them before they have actually been manifested for your sin and using that false counsel to make light of sin and to sear your own conscience and to embolden yourself to enter into the sin without fear of consequence. That is presumptuous sins. And it is the beginning of your path to the great transgression, blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Because you're using the holy attributes of grace, forgiveness, mercy, which come by the blood of Jesus Christ, to embolden yourself, to hold your sin, and to go ahead in your sin. You did not choose the fear of the Lord. You chose presumption. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. I will perform this sin. I want to perform this sin. And I will protect my opportunities to perform this sin. And anybody who challenges me, I will slander them. I will call them evil. Well, so you sear your conscience with that exercise. You sear your conscience and more, over and over again and it gets more seared and more seared and more seared the more you do the presumptuous sin and you're headed towards the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Now I didn't say you committed it or that you fully uh, manifested your, yourself in that blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And that's a whole other subject. You know, he that blasphemes the Holy Ghost is in danger of, you know, yeah, has no forgiveness neither in this life or the life to come. Mm-hmm. means that if, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you don't have forgiveness, all God can do is clobber you with a very, very catastrophic amount of judgment to balance the scales before you die. So it doesn't mean you're damned, but you certainly are in danger of eternal damnation, as Jesus said. And all has to do with, like I say, you can't serve two masters. You're holding to the one. You don't want to let it go. Not estranged from their lust. They were not estranged from their lust. But while the meat was yet in their mouth, the Bible says, God slew them, right? Slew the fattest of them. Even the chosen men of Israel. So... And so by that, you provide yourself an opportunity to sin and bypass or um, defeat the prick of your conscience that should come by choosing the fear of God. Kicking against those pricks. So, we all know that make no provision for the lust of the flesh to fulfill it thereof. And we, we talked about the difference between... Uh, being oppressed and sort of caught off guard, if you will, or uh, sinning incidentally and falling occasionally, being overpowered and overwhelmed by sin because the mystery of iniquity that's driving you into sin has not had full opportunity to be exposed and revealed and cleansed and purged from, and, but you are still embracing the holiness of God, you're choosing the fear of the Lord, you're not deliberately, excessively, repeatedly uh, without conscience, providing yourself as many opportunities to sin as, as you can, or that sort of thing. There's a difference there. Um, so what if the method of you providing opportunity to sin is a misuse of the things God gave you, gifts and calling and authority? So then if I, as a teacher, call that out as a warning, and if I, as a teacher, or you as a saint of God, or anybody, do not consent to the misuse of authority to presume presumably enter into sins and you won't you won't uh, you won't uh, consent to that because it's a perversion of of uh, the the proper use of grace then if i do that then i put myself i line myself up with the course of balaam's ass because balaam's ass saw the angel of the lord not only that well first of all the prophet was in balaam balaam the prophet was in perversion and then the, the ass saw the angel of the Lord, not just see the angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord with a drawn sword. 
judgment, penalty, destruction, a drawn sword against the prophet. And the ass says, boy, I better turn aside. And so he crushes the prophet's foot against the wall. You know, the foot is something you take a step, step for, a step with. So, you know, if the prophet was a, if Balaam was a whoremonger, then the old ass is crushing that whoremonging foot against the wall. And what does the prophet do? The prophet says, you rebel, you know, if I had a sword, I'd kill you. So who has the hate in that situation? Who has the hate and who has the love? I think the ass has the love and the perversion prophet has the hate. But this is the irony of the law of God. The irony of the law of God. As I was just reading in the scriptures today, you know, Haman was against the Jews, right? He made the decree to have them all killed. And he hated Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't uh, bow to him. Because Mordecai was a man who would only bow to God. So, and what happened? Haman made up gallows 50 cubits high to hang Mordecai on. Right? And what, who got hung on the gallows? Haman. Haman hung on his own gallows. Saul falls on his own sword. The wicked will fall by their own counsels. And it's that mirror effect. The very thing that the wicked man is about to fall to, he accuses you of. He accuses the man bearing the burden of the righteous judgment of God in the love of God, concerned about the holiness of God, concerning about you and your seemingly treacherous path that you're recklessly headed towards destruction and all the other people that are being affected by it. And not afraid to indict it all and put himself on the line for that. But you see, but their charges against us are always fleeting, lacking substance, characterized by insults and antagonism and what have you, and, and that, that don't go anywhere. No scriptural substance to it. Is there an indictment against me? What's the indictment? What are the scriptures? What part of the law of God am I transgressing? But you don't hear any of that. Yeah. You don't hear any of it. See, because, he's, because those people are holding on to the opportunity they want to continue their sin, and they're despising the other. So we bear despite for, a true, for bearing a true concern for the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, a concern for the, uh, for the perfection of the saints in all of us. All right, so go ahead and call that hate with nothing to back it up if you want. And when you do that, you know, if what I'm doing is actually hate here, for instance, tonight, if what I'm doing is actually hate, and someone tries to tag me as one who's so full of hate, well, how? How am I full of hate? Expound. But they won't do it because they can't. They can't because they don't have substance. They're, they're in a desperation. There's not love working there. Love's not working there. It's holding to the one and despite to the other. Okay, so if you call what I'm doing here hate, then you're slandering me. And I've gone over the slander issue. There's lots of slander. So I'm going to hit Psalm 50 again. Then talk about lies and lightness and bring it out of this realm into a sort of a general realm of, of mirth and foolishness, which is something that I could say is that I've, I've received indictment against myself on. But um, I, I hope I can volunteer that without people not taking advantage of it. I don't think anybody here will. But um, you'll see where I'm going, I guess. So Psalm 50. The mighty God, even the Lord of the spoken, called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion the perfection of beauty God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. If fire shall devour before him, it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice in the heavens shall declare his righteousness for God as judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify 
against thee. See, God's testifying against us. Just like when I said to Zechariah, he's clothed in his filthy garments, he's accepted by God, sitting at the right hand, right? Mm -hmm. Given a position of judgment, thou shalt judge my house, representing us, the church, the body of Christ, in our filthy garments, in our sinful flesh. And yet for all that, the Lord said, stood up and said, and the Lord protested unto Joshua. God is still going to protest our walk where it doesn't line up with the law of God. We're still going to have that issue that God testifies against us in whatever areas, right? Hear my people, I will speak, or Israel, I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I won't reprove you for your sacrifices or burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of your house, nor he goats out of thy folds. Every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. So we're not going to impress God with sacrifices or anything else. You know, he, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can get that stuff. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. Because <laughs> you know, right? you're man. And you, would, you would try to exploit it and take advantage of you know, God's hungry. He, I wouldn't tell you. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. We would think that somehow we could satisfy God's hunger and we're like we're greater than God or something. You know, God's not going to do that. So if I were hungry, I would not tell thee the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving. Pay thy vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Yeah, you're in trouble. You're getting overwhelmed with sin. Call upon me. Don't go doing it presumptuously, deliberately, in a way that shows that you am love the darkness or you uh, hold on you're holding on no we have to stop protecting our opportunities to sin under false pretenses and presumption and a distorted idea of what grace and mercy and forgiveness are for call upon me in the day of trouble I will deliver thee thou shalt glorify unto me but unto the wicked God saith what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, castest my words behind thee? See, they, they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They could have chose it. They cast it aside. And I'm saying anyone who is holding on to their sin, not estranged from their lust, protecting their opportunities of sin, these are people who have been presented the knowledge of God and the fear of God. At that point, you have to make a choice. They did not choose the fear of the Lord. Shove it aside. Hated instruction and castest my words behind thee. When thou saw a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speaketh against thy brother. It's a good warning for all of us. We enter into judgment. We don't want to enter into slander. You, know, you do want to have a righteous balance, a righteous motivation for judgment. You want to prove all things, judge nothing before the time, and all that kind of stuff we talked about for the last few weeks. Thou speakest against thy brother, thy, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest thou was altogether such a one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set the minority before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. So what do you think? Am I full of condemnation? Am I full of condemnation? You know, as we said before, you know, we've heard preachers say, Hey, you know, I can sit and preach against hypocrites all day long and it won't bother any of you. I can say as many bad things about hypocrites as I want all day long. It wouldn't bother any one of you unless you're one of the hypocrites. And if you're not one of the hypocrites, it doesn't bother you, right? Can I talk about whoremonging and sexual immorality all day long? Shouldn't bother you if you're not a whoremonger, right? That's, that has nothing to do with you, right? Because you're not a whoremonger. <laughs> but some people expose themselves by their very reaction to this stuff. Lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver? Well, we're, that doesn't mean we're, we're locked in or anything. It's the same old thing. Here's what you're doing. Continue in that. This is the result. This is what will happen. 
It's a pronouncement that describes something in the law of God that involves cause and effect, and you are producing a cause, and this was what the Bible says the effect is going to be. You better stop. Yeah. You call it hate if you want to. <laughs> I don't call it hate. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Ghost that I'm not in, in hatred. Now, I'm sure I have as much potential as you and uh, anything else in the issues of judgment. We've got to watch that we don't turn to hatred. That's, that's true, too. It's a very valid consideration in judgment as well. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. You know what conversation means there, right? It doesn't mean your mouth. Conversation means lifestyle, your life actions, your life deeds. Order your conversation aright, and I will show the, con- the, the salvation of God. So now the rest of it is going to be sort of a general call to sobriety and a promoting of godly fear and uh, <clears throat> just the idea of mocking at sin. You don't want to mock sin or make light at sin. And you want to watch it because in, in the, you, you, you can read comic books. A lot of the comic books sort of make a mockery of the actions and deeds of sin. Cartoons do it. Comic books do it. And comic relief is something that gives, uh, you know, it, it's it's like... You know, the rich, the rich man was in hell and he asked for a drop of water to cool his tongue in his torment. Well, the, in this life, it's not that bad. I mean, we're, we, we end up in our own little hell at times in our um, conditions of being in torment. And when we are in torment, sometimes we crave even the slightest little drop of relief. And they call that comic relief. And that's the appeal to comedy is that it is a split-second departure of the awareness of the torment that you're in. Then, of course, the comic sits down and the joke is now told and you're back to your torment, right? So, but fools make a mock at sin. Anything that makes a mock at sin or belittles its consequence in such a way that it defeats the fear of God or helps people not to choose the fear of the Lord. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And I'll say depart from evil practices. Not just evil in terms of evil thoughts or not evil just in terms of uh, unbelief, but you depart from evil. So, and, you know, there's a tendency in our carnal minds that we like to uh, make light of others' sins or follies or weaknesses and to make ourselves not feel so bad. You know, if, I'm, if I can, uh, I don't know, if, if I have a weakness that I forget to do things or something and then I see someone else who forgets to do things ten times as bad as me and I can mock him and make feel better, at least I'm not, I'm not that bad. Okay, that's the tendency of the carnal mind. Okay, so I'm going to read some scriptures and Proverbs and then uh, maybe James here. You'll see, I'll, I'll read some scriptures, a compilation of scriptures, and maybe I'll just read them or make comments. We'll see. Merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. Uh, not a, um, okay, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And so who is it that God doesn't despise? A what? What's a broken and a contrite spirit? A broken and a contrite spirit is something that we should be in pursuit of. Yeah. And the uh, merry heart might make a cheerful countenance, but the more important thing is to achieve godly sorrow and a broken spirit, broken and contrite. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. Right? So we might find comic relief to be joyful, but it's actually a form of folly because it doesn't accomplish the purpose of God. It's sort of the slightly healing uh, approach there. There is a way which seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of that mirth is heaviness. Because you laugh, you have the mirth, and even while it's happening, your heart is still sorrowful, and then when it's all over, 
you, you realize I still have the sorrow. This didn't really affect anything. And there's the letdown again of it not alleviating your sorrow, which might leave you with a deeper sorrow for all we know. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Well, I can relate to that to a certain extent on the knowledge issue. It's, there's a lot of sorrow in knowledge. Right? Because if you don't know, how can you be affected by it? That's why I'm saying, how can you fear God without the knowledge of God? And if you hate the knowledge of God and don't choose the fear of the Lord, then you're going to be... You know, no, no man can serve two masters. You'll end up holding to your lust and despising everybody else. And you're not loving God in that. I send my heart, go to, I will prove thee with mirth. This is Solomon, of course, in Ecclesiastes. I'll prove thee with mirth and I'll enjoy pleasure. Behold, this is also vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad. And of mirth, what do with it? What does this do? Better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of house of fools is in the house of mirth. So anything like that, you know, when you make light and uh, sort of sport and fun and frolic and things like that, We've heard preachers who are preaching and promoting and advocating that, that, the, that the people of God be serious, and this is serious, and this is sober, and yet when it comes to their favorite subject or their favorite sin, or if they're talking about women that they like and stuff, they start wheezing and laughing and fun and frolic and foolish and almost panting like dogs in their laughter. Okay? The Bible says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So him that has had in reputation for wisdom and honor. So if, if I, as a teacher, am had in reputation for wisdom and honor, and then I go out and all I do is I fun and frolic and be foolish and carry on with mirth and we laughter and so on and so forth over much or, or in the wrong context, well, then I send forth a stinking savor. I'm not saying there's no such thing as laughter. There are certain things in life that are funny, but I'm saying to seek comic relief as an appeasement to your wounds and your sense of torment is, is, is not fulfilling the law of God. All right, so it's better to go to the house of mourning. Dead flies cause a stinking savor. It's just like going up there and being someone who's supposed to be known for wisdom and honor and stature and everything else and all this folly and stuff comes out of you it's like it's like cutting a big fart in the spirit it's like a spiritual fart it stinks it puts forth a stinking savor it's supposed to be the sweet anointing fragrance of the spirit of god all right so better to go sorrow is better than laughter Sadness of the countenance, the heart's made better. The house of the wise is in the house of mourning. The house of fools is in the house of mirth. Better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For it's the crackling of thorns under a pot. So is the laughter of a fool. This is also vanity. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be sorrowful we're supposed to be the afflicted and poor people jesus seeing the multitudes goes up into the mountain when he was set his disciples came unto him he opened his mouth saying blessed are the ones frolicking and laughing and sporting with the girls or blessed are they that can really crack the good one liners and get everybody at the table laughing blessed are the ones who are the life of the party you know blessed are the poor Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. And then you move on to James. You lust, you have not, you kill, you desire to have, you cannot obtain, you fight, your war, you have not, because you ask not, you ask and you receive not, because you ask amiss. You may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whatsoever therefore will, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, it's the enemy of God. Do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth envy? But it giveth more grace. 
Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. That sounds like a command. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy into heaviness. Now, we were listening to a preacher the other day, and I was amongst brethren, and the preacher was preaching, and he was doing some very, very grievous things, saying some grievous things, very much exposing himself, and saying as an excuse, oh, God has me doing this on purpose to see the reaction that's going to come out of you. And I said this before, and I'll say it again. God never has a man of God operating in the Spirit of God do something that is inherently unrighteous or sinful or evil to see to, to prove the response that will come out of you. Because God is not tempted, neither tempteth he any man. God never uses an evil motion. God never uses an evil method to tempt or try you to see what evil is in you. But he will let every man be drawn of his own lust. He will let a temptation come to you to reveal that there is something in you that can be tempted, but he himself will not do the tempting. He is not tempted of any man, neither does he tempt any man. Spirit of God never does that. And no man operating in the Spirit of God ever does that. This is simply folly. And be afflicted and mourn. Let your life return to mourning. So we're sitting there watching this folly go on. It's like dead flies, it stinks, it's sexual in nature. It's mockery. It's flagrant. It's like a. It's like it's like the uh, the flasher, the man who is a flasher, exposing himself deliberately. Very grievous. And then I saw a brethren begin to go, oh, oh, right. There it is. Be afflicted and mourn. The brother that did that that day, I mean, I didn't see it, but I, I guarantee you there was an, uh, an angel with a writer's ink horn marking that man's forehead. Mark them that sigh and cry for all the... Yeah, so th there's the right response. We don't, not that we get puffed up or anything about it. Be afflicted and mourn. <laughs> Let your laughter be turned to... Sorrow, mourning, mourning, weeping. Titus chapter 2. Well, yeah, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy be turned to heaviness. Speak thou the things... Well, I'm saying this because, you know, I, I'm not saying I'm guiltless in the issues of uh, comic relief or anything like that, but we have a very uh, generation that very much caters to comic relief, full of lightness. So that's something we need to be re reminded of. Okay, Speak the things that, which become sound doctrine. You make an indictment, make it with sound doctrine. You accuse someone of being full of hate, let's hear it with sound doctrine. Okay, And I will do the same. And may God give us grace to receive that witness against what we're doing that is not in the law of God. But... The aged men are to be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged woman that they be in behavior, in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to wine teachers, of, not given to much wine teachers of good things, that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. It's just a general sobriety pitch. In all things, showing us yourself a pattern of good works, a pattern of good works. Hey, yeah, we're not saved by works, are we? Huh? But yet, 
the result of this is we should be able to show a good conversation, a good lifestyle, a pattern of good works, which are the works of Jesus Christ manifested through us. A pattern of good works. In doctrine showing uncorruptness, soundness, doctrine, not, not just principles that could be interpreted one of ten or twelve ways because they're never spelled out, they're never expounded, they never land anywhere. But the doctrine has to be uncorrupt, it has to be sound, it has to be supported with many principles upon principles upon principles, a picture. Sound doctrine has to be endured because sound, what makes doctrine sound is that the doctrine is supported by so many other principles and scriptures that it becomes impossible to misinterpret that based on all the other supporting scriptures, which takes time to expound. It takes time to bring it all forth and lay the precept upon the precept upon the precept. Sound doctrine has to be endured. Now I can say, Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner. Jesus Christ died for sinners. So Jesus Christ came to say, die for me. Well, that's true. That's, that's true doctrine. But you can go a lot of places with that. You can right. You can take that um, one of a dozen different directions that may or may not be the will of God. So I'm not saying it's false in principle, but it always needs to be measured out, spread out, expounded. And that takes endurance. So, in all things, the young men, in all things, showing a pattern of good works and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. In other words, as much as it lies in you, as much as you're able, take the occasion away from people to have occasion to say evil things against you. Yeah. Just like Paul says, look, I was in the ministry, he said, look, giving no offense in anything so that the ministry cannot be blamed. You mean Paul had a deliberate, willful, conscious pursuit of making sure he did everything he could so as to not cause offense so that nobody would have the chance to blame the ministry. Yeah, that's what Paul did. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of the redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking put away, be put away from you with all malice, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So you see, in the midst of all this charge and indictment of God against us and against the evil that God is dealing with, the law of Christ doesn't abandon the idea of being kind, tender-hearted, you know, because the judgment and all of that has that severity behind it. And when you do choose the fear, of, when you do love knowledge and do choose the fear of the Lord, there can come a severity with it, an intensity, a trembling, a very intense thing. And that's why the Bible in the book of Acts talks about how they, in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Rest assured, with the intensity of uh, and the severity of hearing about the indictment of God against us and the judgments of God and the judgment of God with that if you choose godly fear and receive that it will be followed by the comfort of the Holy Ghost and be ye kind one to another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you and ye be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, 
that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Okay, and the last few scriptures and I'm done. So, flipping back and forth between scriptures that uh, describe godly fear and ungodly fear. Uh, ungodly fear is but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstones, which is the second death. Okay, so... Not just fearful and unbelieving, but abominable. Murders, whoremongers, sorcerers, all have their part in the lake of fire. Why? Because the fearful, the fearful and the unbelieving, the fearful are paralyzed. They will not reach out. They will not take the step of faith. Remember I said ungodly fear paralyzes you. That's the kind of fear he's talking about here. The people who are fearful, they're afraid of, uh, and they, they are seeking to um, uh, keep themselves and protect themselves, and so therefore they're afraid to do anything for the fear of doing something wrong, or they're afraid to step out in faith. Faith has a certain cleanness to it. It has a certain confidence in God, and a certain hope in mercy, a certain acknowledgement that God's grace is on me, and I'm not sure if this is right or wrong, but I feel like this. I should do this. God wants me to do this. So if I don't do it, I'll never know if it's right or wrong. But if I stretch out and if I do it as unto the Lord, not presumptuously or not for selfish reasons, but if I do it, then whatever falls out will reveal to me whether it's right or wrong. And the grace of God will keep me. And when my work is judged... If it's wrong, I'll return to the righteousness of God. You know, God will... There's a certain confidence you have in the law of Christ that if you step out, like Abraham went out, he didn't know whether he was going. He didn't have the whole thing laid out before him. And that's the way it is with us sometimes when we take a step. We reach out by faith. But if you have ungodly fear, you'll be afraid to make the first step of faith. But it's necessary for us to take that step of faith to set the whole thing in motion in process. It's triggered by our step of faith. So you can't have ungodly fear that paralyzes you from stepping out in faith in a given situation. And of course, God talk, now talking about godly fear, fear not them which kill the body and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, that is God. So fear God. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? It, how is it that you have no faith? You know, when they're out in this boat in the sea and the, they were in the storm and the winds and the waves were beating on them and everything else. And they were fearful. And Jesus says, How is it that you have no faith? And ironically, and they feared exceedingly. That made him fear even more. This is before they had the Holy Ghost and everything. And they said one, one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love, that is no ungodly fear, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. See, but the fear of the Lord is, it's no, no torment in it, it's not torment, there's intensity, there's gravity, there's an awesome realization that all, all you know, heaven and hell is at stake, and I've got to work out my salvation, but not, not torment. No fear in love, perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You know, the devil all their lifetime keeps us bondage through the fear of death. See? Ungodly fear. Fear of death. Not only fear of physical death, but fear of losing face in the sight of other people. You know, oh, if I, if I do this, then the, these people will 
despise me or they won't they won't think highly they'll think I'm a religious freak if I go to church or if I make this stand or if I say this you know fear of death fear of uh, losing your status among what other people think of you so that you can't you can't be motivated by that you have received the spirit of bondage you have not received the spirit of bondage again the fear but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father so God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And when First John is writing to the young man, he says, I write unto you, young men. Well, he says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you've known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you've known the father. But... To the young men, he says, you've overcome the wicked one. And he says again, I have written unto you, young man, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you've overcome the wicked one, the young men. And I'm saying the chief way that we overcome the wicked one is to, we, we are no longer fearful in the evil sense. We no longer let his threatenings and let ungodly fears choke us up and choke us out, and paralyze us, and make us afraid to do anything, to reach out, to take a step of faith. And that makes us able to take a step of faith, without fear of damnation, per se, knowing that grace is on us, mercy is on us, God will judge, He will correct, but He will sustain us, He will forgive us, for our wrongdoings, and keep us in a status of confidence with God as we work all this stuff out. And then we will be able to step out in faith and initiate, set in motion the law of Christ that will perfect us. We have to step out in faith first. You know that, right? Draw nigh to God, and then He will draw nigh to you. Now initially, Jesus Christ apprehends us brings us into the church, but like he said to Paul, like Paul said, if I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. So Jesus apprehended Paul on the road to Damascus, grabbed a hold of him, brought him into the fold, brought him into Christ, and then said, okay, Paul, now you apprehend me. Go, you know, Pursue a relationship with me. Pursue perfection with me. So it's up to Paul to step out in faith. It's up to us to step out in faith. That that sets the whole operation of God in motion. And until we do that, we're just paralyzed, stagnant, going nowhere. You need a motion for God to work with. And if you're in motion, you can steer the motion, right? It's like you ever try to steer a car that's standing still with no power steering? It's really hard to yeah. try to... But if the car has a little bit of movement... It could be headed the wrong way, but because it has the movement, it's easier to steer it into a proper path. So, eventually we have to reach out and we have to do something as reaching out unto the Lord. Fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Okay, so that's the relationship between judgment and godly fear and other things. And that's it. I'm done for today. Bless you.